The last speaker of this morning uh, session, before we go to aortic innovation, is uh, Frank Arco. He doesn't need any introduction, I presume. It's the flex scoring catheter, another device. Uh, yeah. All right, thank you. So sort of going off uh, Peter's same uh, theme, uh, I'm not uh, the CMO of this company. I actually have no conflict of interest at all with this company. So uh, yeah. I'm just gonna talk to you about the uh, flex scoring catheter. Uh, these are my um, disclosures, but it has nothing to do with this talk. And Peter sort of went over this, but really what's the purpose of vessel preparation? Well, it's really to try to create an optimal environment for angioplasty and improving that vessel compliance really can try to get you to lower the balloon pressures for lesion uh, effacement. And uh, Peter showed you that in, uh, with his technology. Uh, you're also trying to increase the luminal gain. And if you're gonna use DCB, facilitate drug uh, distribution. And furthermore, try to minimize the adverse events such as dissections, embolization, perforations, and potentially decrease the need for stenting uh, as well. So this is the uh, actual flex scoring catheter. Now the difference between this uh, flex scoring catheter and some of the other uh, scoring technologies that you would have on a balloon is those are more forced dilatations, whereas this is just done under about one atmosphere of pressure. And as you see here, it's six French compatible. It goes over an 014 and 018 wire. Catheter lengths are 40 centimeters and 120 centimeters because they have indication for both the uh, uh, femoral popliteal segment as well as for AV grafts. You can see there the atherotomes. Now it's a retrograde cutting. So all the scoring elements or the cutting elements are on the back surface. So you're actually gonna pass the lesion, open it up and then pull backwards. The nice thing about it is it's three, three, three elements or atherotomes, but you can go back in, rotate it 30 degrees pull it back, go back in, rotate it 30 degrees, no exchanges of balloons, and you can get a nice uh, a cut, uh, almost up to uh, nine cuts, uh, if you will. So this is the technique, as you would see. Again, you'd pass it over the wire, 014 or 018. Uh, you're gonna pull those back, and you can see uh, the scoring that you get as it's come through the vessel. So you would advance that catheter back up, just turn it 30 degrees one way or the other, and then pull it back. Again. Uh, showing again the uh, OCT, you can see here, uh, just right here where the scoring elements are, here, here, and over here, you'd advance it for, turn it 30 degrees and pull it back. So again, it, control, it, it gives you controlled depth uh, micro uh, uh, incision. It's again with the retrograde uh, pullback. It's rotational control, so it's very nice one-to-one -one, uh, torquing. And the dynamic uh, scoring technique is nice because you'll only need one device. So you don't need a, a, a significant number of SKUs, so this is a one size fits all uh, for the vessels. So here you can see just in the patient, uh, this is actually in the below knee uh, area. So the devices come back, you can see those scoring elements come back on their own and they sort of get compressed down the lesion. And again, those atherotomes interact with the vessel surface just at one atmosphere. So it creates a very nice controlled environment uh, for angioplasty. We'll just go over a couple of cases here. So this is uh, treatment in the SFA. Uh, vessel diameter is four millimeters. Lesion length is uh, right at eight centimeters. A mild amount of uh, um, calcification. Uh, no vessel prep, so the only vessel prep is with the flexed catheter. Uh, and then the patient was treated with uh, DCB uh, following. Uh, so this is what you can see here, uh, pre-angiogram. Uh, the middle screen is the post-flex, so the uh, uh, two turns with the atherotome. So again, here you can see we go to roughly a total occlusion to about a 60% uh, stenosis. But then again, look at the DCB opening. So the nominal pressure on this uh, DCB balloon was 12, uh, but we got the complete effacement of the balloon at just six atmospheres. And then you can see uh, post-DCB stenosis was right around 10%, uh, and no evidence of dissection and no further therapy was done. Again, just another case in the SFA, vessel diameter, and this one is six, lesion length, uh, 16 centimeters, uh, total occlusion, mild amount of calcification, vessel prep again was done with the flex catheter, passing it through, pulling it all the way back, going back and rotating it uh, 30 degrees and pulling it back, and then treatment with uh, POBA. So again, a six by 150, three minute inflation times two, this is the pre-angiogram, and here you can see, just take a look at the middle section. This is just after the uh, uh, flex catheter uh, with the uh, roughly uh, six uh, uh, scoring uh, elements done with the two rotations. 
and then post-intervention with the balloon. So again, got about 25% luminal gain just with the flex catheter alone. Again, the uh, effacement of the balloon uh, with the DCB was right at six millimeters of mercury. Uh, uh, total pressure was a 12. And again, you can see the result uh, post-intervention, uh, no stenting, very nice result uh, with no evidence of uh, dissection. Uh, finally, one more case here, again, SFA, long lesion, 250 centimeters, a severe amount of calcification, again, uh, treated first with the flexed catheter, uh, and then treated with the two DCB balloons um, at uh, five millimeters of diameter. But again, take a look at the flex stenosis, clearly there, uh, uh, post-flex uh, therapy. Clearly there's some areas where there's still about 80% uh, uh, stenosis, but certainly the entire vessel's open, certainly down by the adductor uh, hiatus. I would roughly say there's about a 60% improvement in luminal gain uh, just with that. A patient was then treated with DCB. Again, nominal uh, effacement of the balloon was at five, uh, uh, treated at eight millimeters of uh, uh, pressure, and again, uh, post-DCB stenosis uh, right at 5%, no evidence of dissection, no other therapy. And again, the cost of this device uh, sort of mirrors that of other scoring technologies and is significantly cheaper with less setup than any other atherectomy device that you may use. So if you take a look at the post-market clinical data, in, and there is some, uh, it's been performed by 80 physicians at over 53 institutions. Uh, you can see there the overall lesion length for the variety of different uh, patients. Uh, the majority of these patients had uh, uh, moderate to severe uh, calcification, so over half. Uh, number of lesions treated was 322, average stenosis was about 92%, and again, nearly half of these were uh, CTOs. Again, a post-flex luminal gain uh, without any other interventions was right at about 26%. The mean balloon uh, opening pressure for these uh, patients uh, was right at 4.3%. So again, uh, you don't have to use uh, so much pressure to uh, open them up, and really hopefully limiting that risk of uh, dissection. Again, uh, overall technical success has been quite good at 99%. Uh, very low risk of vessel dissection. Again, this was a registry, so there was no uh, um, uh, physicians were sort of left up to what they wanted to do with regards to uh, uh, post-intervention stenting. But again, you can see overall provisional stent use was right at 19.9%, uh, uh, which, which is really quite favorable to other uh, DCB trials. Aboriginal luminal gain was right at uh, 82%. So in conclusion, the flex catheter is a safe, effective uh, uh, therapy for treating complex femoral popliteal lesions. Uh, it gives a high degree of technical success is achieved. It's quite easy and simple to use. Uh, you can attain, uh, um, and it limits the risk of a flow-limiting dissection, emboli of perforations, and it offers you the ability to treat the lesions with low opening balloon pressures, which suggests an improvement in vessel wall compliance uh, after vessel preparation. And the low dissection rate uh, should should uh, translate into less stenting post procedure. Thank you very much. We do have some minutes for. We have a, a short questions, short questions, short answers. Yes, please, David. Hey, Frank, that's a great talk. Um, is there any uh, reason for the height of the uh, blades? Uh, should they be higher or smaller? I mean, you had, I think you said it's 0.01 inches, or how was that height chosen? I think the way that they uh, developed that was try to limit the uh, damage that was going out to the adventitial wall. So uh, they just wanted to create the, uh, the scoring very much like you would just a knife with a razor blade coming through uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, lesions. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm unsure of the cadaver work, so I have not been involved with this company from the very beginning, but uh, the, the person who's invented it could probably answer that question. Dr. Peter. Hi, uh, John Pickett uh, from Ohio. I am the founder and, and chief medical officer of, uh, of VentureMed who created this. And I think, uh, Dr. Deaton, to answer your question, we chose the blade height for two things. Number one, regulatory, because with our predicates, we didn't want to be uh, taller in height, and I think the second thing is, it's very important if you look at some studies, is that height allows you to avoid contact with the elastic lamina. And so there's a lot of data coming out that if you do injure, perforate that elastic lamina, that's one of the contributors to restenosis. So. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, additional explanation. Thanks, Frank, for 